Thank you, ladies, very much. Thank you, thank you. That was beautiful, wasn't it? Uh, those who haven't, I know most of you know Daryl but those who haven't met Kathy Boone, Kathy is our receptionist who's been working with us for uh, since last March. So if you hadn't had a chance to meet her, I hope you have a chance to meet her after the service. The message today is continuing our series on spiritual warfare. And as we've discussed before, this is a battle that we're in. We're in a battle every day. Every day. And if you haven't noticed, the world is diametrically opposed those that are of Jesus. You know, every day, every hour, every minute, we are in a battle. And I want to review our verse that we have been uh, going over every week uh, from Ephesians. Ephesians 6 verse 12. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of the, this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. You know, the things that we battle against isn't always the things that we can put our hands on. It's nothing that we can deploy an army against. There are defenses that we have are spiritual. Last week, we looked at the devil as being our enemy. And, 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 but we as Christians must realize that though the devil may affect circumstances round about us, the devil may tempt us the devil cannot make you do anything. It is our flesh that is weak. And as we're going to come to find out, and as we're going to see, we've inherited a sinful nature. And that's at war within us. In his book, uh, Charles Colson writes in his book, Be in the Body, he writes... What Oprah, and you all know who Oprah is, Oprah, uh, what Oprah is preaching is not particularly new. It is just that the combination of her public access and immense influence, as well as the particular appeal of her own earnest searching for meaning, makes it uniquely 21st century. The church of Oprah, if you will, encourages people to ask all the right questions about life, meaning, service to others, identity, and then she encourages people to look precisely in the wrong place to find those answers. She says that you have to look within. Unfortunately, the answers to life questions are not within us. And that's where the problem lie. You see, we're all sinners. We're not saviors. The answer is outside of ourselves. We don't need personal reflection. We need a savior. One who can forgive and save us from our sins. The answers to life are not found within us. In fact, uh, I talked about this in sermons past. You know, those who... Follow their heart. You know what the Bible says about our heart? Jeremiah 17, verse 9. And this is God speaking. It, 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 if you look in the previous verses, the Lord says, He says, the heart is more deceitful than all else and desperately sick. King James says, and desperately wicked. Who can understand it? The verse that follows says, I, the Lord, test the heart. Boy, I tell you what, that's a scary thought, knowing that God knows my heart better than I do. Because there are in the pits of my heart some things I don't want out. The heart is desperately wicked. This is where we stand. And today we look at the battle that we face every day, and the fact of the matter is the enemy... One of the enemies we fight, yes, we've got the devil who tempts us, but one of the devil, one of the enemies that we fight are within ourselves, our flesh. 
and hence the title of today's message is the enemy part two. We're gonna look at the flesh. And the fact is, for most of us, living the true Christian life, we tend to be our own worst enemies. Turn, if you would, with me to Galatians. Just read about this over in Romans, but we're gonna look at another aspect of this in Galatians 5. Galatians chapter 5, we're going to look at verses 16 through 26. I'll be reading from the New American Standard. Verse 16, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envy, and drunkenness, carousing, and things like these, of which I forewarn you, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let us not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we look at this pas passage, Lord, and we identify some of the workings and deeds of the flesh, may we also realize that with the Spirit within us, Lord, that we should be displaying the fruit of the Spirit and these things that were listed as well. Lord, may we live a life that is pleasing to you. May we live a life that displays the fruit of the Spirit. Lord, open up our hearts, our minds, our understanding to your word this morning. And may Jesus be glorified in this place today. For it's in his holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. I was reading a story, and it was kind of funny. It was uh, a man walked into a hardware store, and, and, and he walked out with a big smile on the face because he had a brand-new chainsaw. He had some big trees to cut down, and they said, with this chainsaw, you can cut down five big oaks in an hour. Well, the next day, 24 hours later, he walked back into the store with a frown on his face. He was complaining that the saw never cut five trees in an hour. He spent all day cutting down one tree. And, and, and the store owner, he, he was surprised. He says, well, what's the matter? And he took the saw and he went outside and he grabbed the saw and he took the handle and he gave it a good yank and it roared life. And the customer jumped back and said, what's that noise? <laughs> You see, that's how most Christians live. We got the tool, <laughs> but we, uh, and we claim to have the Holy Spirit, but we're never filled with the Spirit's power, nor do we trust in the Spirit to live their life. You see, the fact is, and I'm not telling you anything new, life is a struggle. Certainly the Christian life is a struggle. It's a struggle physically. It's a struggle emotionally. It's certainly a struggle spiritually. And as we read from Ephesians a minute ago, our war, this battle that we fight is not against physical things, but it's against the evil in heavenly places. 
We have many foes in this battle, but one of the first that we have to contend with is ourselves. And as I mentioned earlier, oftentimes we're, we tend to be our own worst enemy. Galatians 5 verse 16, Paul writes, he says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. The lust of the flesh, well, what exactly is that? Well, the fact of the matter is, and we can go... ...be selfish or to lie. You don't have to tell children, teach children how to do that. They learn real well all on their own. And the fact is, we inherited it from Adam. It's in our genes. It's genetic. You know, and we're faced with the lust of the flesh. We're faced with our sinful nature. And Paul is telling the church in Galatia, you've got to remember Galatians. Uh, if, if you get into a little bit of church history and the makeup of the Bible, Galatians was probably one of the first books of the New Testament written. And Paul wrote it. And, and, and he's explaining these things, the church in Galatia, that they must walk in the Spirit to avoid succumbing to that sinful nature. Let's look at verses 17 and 18. He says, For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. Verse 18, But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Think about that. You know, the law is only against, the, uh, uh, against our sinful nature. Don't do this, don't do that. You shall do this and you shall not do that. We know all about that. But if we're following the Spirit, there's no law about that. You know, to do good, we only need laws to keep us from doing bad. There's no law against being led by the Spirit. And, and here's the problem. There are two natures within the believer, and they're at odds with one another. The spirit and the flesh, our sinful nature, in constant conflict with, our, with the spirit that's within us. I'm not talking about unbelievers here. I'm talking about believers. This is, this is focused to those who know Jesus. Anybody not have a conflict? <laughs> hmm. We deal with temptation all the time. I'm going to talk more about that here in a minute. You see, we have problems, and then we throw in the devil tempting us for good measure. And it's a battle that rages. Paul understood that. Paul, in fact, if you go through a lot of his writings, deal with that conflict that is going in within us. Uh, uh, Jess read from chapter 8 this morning, but I want to go back a chapter in Romans, uh, Romans chapter 7. Paul talks about this. Now listen to these words that Paul, Paul writes. It's, it, it describes me to a T. It, it says in verse 15, he says, For what I am doing I do not understand. For I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing I hate. But if I do the very thing I do not want to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. So now, no longer am I the one doing it, but the sin which dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, my flesh. For the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. You know, flesh is willing. I mean, the uh, spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Yeah, we know that one. Yeah. Uh, for the good that I want to do, verse 19, for the good that I want to do, I do not do. But I practice the very evil that I do not want. But if I am doing the very thing I do not want, I, I am no longer the one doing it, but the sin that which dwells in me. And I find then the principle that the evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. Anybody identify with that? I sure do. I sure do. You know, we got this struggle all the time. And, and, and Paul, if we skip down a couple of verses, Romans 7 verse 24, he cries out in desperation. He says, wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? 
Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, on one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other, with my flesh, the law of sin. Now go to the first verse in chapter 8, and this is what I love. It says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Do I sin? You bet. We all sin. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But if we confess our sins, he is right and just, and he will forgive us from our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We live a, a life of repentance and a life of forgiveness. The question is, as we go through our daily lives, which one do we gratify? Do we gratify the spirit or do we gratify our sinful nature? You know, the answer is obvious, but it's not so simple, is it? It's not so simple. We know what we ought to do. I want to examine our sinful nature for just a moment. Looking at Galatians 5, verses 19 through the first part of verse 21. He says, Now the deeds of the flesh are evident, which are immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, imitates, uh, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, fractions, uh, envy and drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. What a list. And things like these. This is not a complete list. We can add a lot more to it. Let's, let's look at them just very briefly. We're not going to analyze them very deeply. But immorality. If you got the King James, it has fornication. Okay? The, the word in the Greek is pornelia. That word pornelia, this is where we get our word pornography from. Porno means immorality. Uh, pornography, graphy means writings. So immoral writings, if you will, is what pornography means. And, and, and lewdness and debauchery, those are immorality without shame, open and in front of the world, if you will. Sorcery, that's an interesting word, especially in the Greek. The, the word in the Greek is pharmakia, from which we get our word pharmacy from. It's talking about drugs. Drugs of that day. They had their powders. They had those things. Especially in the pagan worship, they would have powders that would bring on hallucination and things. And, and it was associated with occultic practices involving interaction with evil spirits. Yes, there was a drug problem in Paul's day also. Also. What was interesting is as I was studying that word, uh, that word sorcery, that word pharmakia, was also associated with abortion. They knew what powders, what drugs would bring on miscarriage in women. So it was associated with abortion as well. Interesting, interesting. Imites, it's another word for hatred, strife discord, the results of hatred, jealousy, bad feelings about others, about others' good fortunes, if you will. I'm holding it against that things are help, happening well for somebody, if you will. I'm jealous. Anger. When a person is angry, think about it. If you're in fits of anger, you're not in your right mind. Why do you think, and we talked about this last week, why do you think the Bible says, uh, in your anger, be angry, but do not sin? We're not in our right minds. We've got to be careful. Anger, dissension, fractions, causing discord among ourselves. Envying, that's nothing more than covetousness. Isn't that one of the big ten, you know? Thou shalt not covet. It's wanting what others have. Then we have drunkenness, carousing. Uh, these are dealing with excessive use of alcohol, if you will. Uh, if you have the NIV, rather than carousing, it has orgies. There are th events that happen when there is excess of alcohol. And then Paul adds, and things like these. This is not a complete list by any means. He's just given an example here. 
Let's look at the rest of verse 21. The second half of verse 21, he says, of which I forewarned you, just as I, just as I have forewarned you, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. You know, in today's world, there are quick, there are people who are quick to point out saying, you know, this you can classify as hate speech. You mean if I do all of these things, I'm going, going, to, he going to heaven? How dare you say I'm not going to heaven? I didn't say it. The Word of God says it. The Word of God says it. You see, does, um, does Christians fall into these sins? Uh, the short answer is yes, we fall into them, we get angry, we, 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 we deal with immorality, we deal with all of these things. But the key word here in, in, in the last half of 21, he says, those who practice such things. You know, Christians fall into it, but we don't practice it. Our lives should not be characterized by these things. But if the answer is yes, yes, as a Christian I practice these things, yes, my life is characterized by these sins, then we can legitimately question whether or not that person is really saved. Paul said a similar thing to the Corinthians. Over in 1 Corinthians 6 verses 9 and 10, uh, he writes, he says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators. There's that word porno again, if you will, in the Greek. Fornicators, idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, verse 10. Nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. These are also works of the flesh. Some will say, well, I'm only doing what comes natural, you know. And as I've said before, many in today's world will call this hate speech. But this is coming straight from the Word of God. And in fact, if we look at it, we look at it critically here for a second. Some would call it hate speech. I would actually call it love speech because God has given people fair warning, mm -hmm. is giving fair warning. You know, uh, over in uh, 2 Peter 3, 9, look it up. But, uh, uh, but it says God doesn't want any to perish. He doesn't want any to go into destruction. But he, he calls for all to come into repentance. In writing to the Corinthians, Paul adds in verse 11, he says, 1 Corinthians 6, 11, he says, But such were some of you. God calls us out of these things, calls us out of these sins, calls us to repentance. But such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ in the spirit of our God. We need to understand about these sins because this is how the world operates. We've heard these words before. I know in days gone past, if it feels good to do it. And why is it so wrong if it feels so right? You know, God never asked me my opinion on what's right and wrong. I don't get to determine those things. How can something feel so good be so wrong? And then the one I hear all the time, especially when it concerns homosexuality and other sorts of acts or uh, transgenderism, and I'm not getting into all of that, but uh, uh, there will some will, who will say, well, God made me this way, so it must be okay. It goes against the Word of God. It goes against the Word of God. God, you know, uh, there are those who equate our actions to those of the animals. Well, we're just nothing but an intelligent animal. Well, you know, God gave us a brain. God gave us will. God gave us the ability to change. He gave us the spirit. The problem with people in our world is that right and wrong is determined by human logic, by human reasoning, by our emotions, if you will and by our emotions and by our feelings. But right and wrong is determined by the word of God, by the word of God. My opinion about right and wrong does not matter a flip. What does the word of God have to say? 
What does the word of God have to say? Proverbs 14 verse 12 says, There is a way which seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. Is the way of death. Look at the world around us. Look at the world around us. Open your newspaper. Check the news channels out. We have a world that gives in to the flesh gives into a flesh, a, a world and a culture that does whatever they feel like doing. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5. Timothy, uh, Paul writes to Timothy, he says, but realize this, that, that in the last days, difficult times will come. I'm going to probably preach on this passage here, here in, a, in another month or so when I talk about the signs of the times. The day in the last days, aloha, we're there. In the last days, difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents. Listen up, kids. Disobedient to parents in the end days. Ungrateful, unholy, unloving, incorcilable, uh, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal haters of good, treacherous, Reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Dwell on that one for a minute. Lovers of pleasure. We, we, we love our pleasures, don't we? We love our TV, our computers. We, we love our vacations. We love our, at any rate, rather than lovers of God. Holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power, Avoid such men as these. We see this all around us. And the world will pull us into all of these things unless we are following the Spirit. If we're following the Spirit, what does that look like? Here's some verses that I know you all know. We talk about this all the time. Verses 22 and 23, Galatians 5. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. I want you to take note here. This is interesting. In the previous verses, you know, Paul talks about the works or the deeds, plural, of the flesh. There are all of these things. It's a laundry list. But here, we are looking at the Fruit, singular, singular, fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit manifests itself in nine different graces, and there are probably more. This is probably not an end, a, a catch-all list. But we, do you have the fruit of the Spirit that displays all of these things? Not just some of them, all of them, all of them. It's quite a list. We can fake acting out one or two, three or four of these items. But to display all of these fruit or all of these traits of the singular fruit, to provide, to display all of these traits every day requires the work of the Holy Spirit. You know, we can only fake it for a while. But to display it consistently will take the work of the Spirit. Now, I'm not going to get into the particulars of all of these fruit. Perhaps I'll go and preach on the fruit of the Spirit at a later date. But we pretty much understand them. Think about it. We, 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 we get it, you know. Uh, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. We, we understand those things. But what fruit or deeds are we displaying? Jesus calls us to be fruit inspectors. Think about it. Uh, Matthew chapter 7, the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, Jesus was saying, Matthew 7, verses 16 18. He says, you will know them by their fruits. Now, he's talking about false prophets here. But we're to look around. You know, people who say one thing and does another. He says, you will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruits, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor a bad tree produce good fruit. So, so how does this work in real life? What kind of fruit are we producing? Does a real or a true Christian 
produce bad fruit. Let's go back to Galatians 5, verses 24 and 25. He says, now those who belong to Christ Jesus. We did a whole ser uh, sermon series back in the late spring, uh, back in uh, April and May, about what it means to be in Christ. He says, those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. We who are in Christ have crucified the flesh. The world would say, well, we're prudes now. Well, let the world say what they want. Who am I pleasing? Am I pleasing the world? Or am I pleasing Almighty God? We put, the, we, we put to death those things in the flesh. We put to death our sinful nature. And, and I, I don't know about you, but you know, crucifying the sinful nature is something I've got to do every day because it keeps rearing its ugly head. Choosing to walk in the Spirit is a daily choice, an hourly choice. Sometimes it's a minute by minute. Sometimes it's moment by moment. But we have to choose to follow the Spirit. Follow the Spirit. Last week we talked about the devil. The devil uses all the devices at his disposal. And the book of Job, and we, we looked at Job last week uh, just briefly, but he tried to drive, uh, to draw Job away from God by, and make Job sin against God by taking away all that he had and inflicting him with pain. Even Job's wife says, why don't you curse God and die? Hmm? You know, and that's where Job says, you know, the Lord gives and the Lord takes the way. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job never sinned. And then God allowed the devil to tempt Jesus. Think about that. Allowing the devil to tempt Jesus. He pulls out the big guns for this one. Why do you think the Bible calls the devil the tempter? Anybody not tempted by the devil? The devil knows our weaknesses, our walking in the Spirit. What does it say? If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. That walk, that's another interesting word in the, uh, in the Greek. It, the word is a military term. It talks about soldiers in that day. They had to line up. Uh, to go to battle and being in this line and being in this formation is, is, is how they were able to project their offense or defense and whatever they needed to do but but those of us and and I'm looking around the room there's a few of us that have been in the military you know do you think about marching in formation think about it some of you others may have marched in marching bands it's the same thing here I like the NIV it says be in step with the spirit now, if you see a bunch of folks marching, you can pick out the guy that's out of step because his head is bobbing different than everybody else's. You can pick out the one who is out of step, it, it sticks out. We are to be in step with the Spirit. In step. Are we in step with the Spirit? We are tempted every day. We need to be in step. How is one of the ways we do that? This is one I, I talk, I, I, many of you know that I, I have a ministry up at the jail and I talk with folks. Here lately it's all been done over video. But I have folks that I talked with in the jail and this is a verse that I use with a lot of them. They talk about whether it's drugs, whether it's sex, whether it's a lot of other things, alcohol, you, you can fill in the blank. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, Paul writes, he says, No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. In other words, there's nothing new under the sun, as the writer of Ecclesiastes would say. But such is common to man, and God is faithful, who will not allow you to become to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide a way of escape so that you will be able to endure it. You know what our problem is, is we don't always look for that way of escape. Yes, we're always tempted, but there's always a way out. 
but you know, our, our nature is, uh, I'm, I'm going to just check it out just a little bit more. And we check it out and soon we're engulfed. We don't take the way of escape. Being in step means looking for that way of escape when temptation comes around. And, and Paul wrote about this. In fact, if we were to put this in the context, he was talking about it in terms of idolatry, the pagan worship. And pagan worship in Corinth in that day uh, would put Las Vegas to shame. It, uh, it, 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 it was dealing with sinful and sensual practices uh, that was designed to put the sens that to entice the sensual desires of the flesh. And considering all of this and putting this in the context, we got to look at 1 Corinthians 10:14, where he says, "Therefore, and you know I love that word, therefore, he's drawn a conclusion. He says, "My beloved, put your track shoes on. Flee from idolatry. We don't flee from sin. We don't flee from ten temptation. These are what we do to keep in step with the Spirit. When we see a path that the Spirit has laid out for us, we need to take it. The Holy Spirit will not force his way on us. He waits for us to be dependent upon him. We see temptations coming. We need to be saying, Spirit, where's the way out? Where's the way out? When the believer depends upon the Spirit, the believer will not yield to the sinful nature. And you know what? That takes practice. What are we yielding to? Are we yielding to the Spirit or yielding to our sinful nature? It does take practice. It requires us to be in constant step, to be in step, just like a marching group of men, to be in step with the Spirit. If you don't know Jesus, you don't have his Spirit. Just read about that. The fact is, if you don't have the spirit, you're enslaved to the simple nature, whether you realize it or not. You see, being a good person, understand good oftentimes means in the best estimation of the world, not necessarily in God's eyes. But being a good person means you have to resist your sinful nature on your own. And you're still dead in your sins. We're not to look within ourselves for the answers of life. We are to look to the Savior and this life-giving spirit that he gives. Living the life as a Christian is being in step with his spirit. And it's something that we must do moment by moment every day. Every day. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as we look at being in step with the Spirit, as we look at this war that's uh, between our flesh and the Spirit each and every day, Lord, may we keep our eyes on Jesus. May we be in tune to the things of His Spirit. And may we look for those ways of escape that the Spirit provides. May we live a life that is pleasing to you. Lord, it's not the easiest thing to do, and we know it. It's not the easiest thing to do. But Lord, may we learn to rely upon your strength, upon your guidance. May we learn to keep our eyes fixed upon you. May we learn each and every day, Lord, to be in prayer and to be in your word, to be connected. It's when we get disconnected it's when we get apart that we find ourselves falling to these things that were described in your word today lord may we be faithful in displaying the fruit of the spirit lord there may be someone here today there may be someone listening to this live stream there may be someone that listening to the recording later that does not know Jesus. And Lord, I pray they come to a saving knowledge, that they have the spirit, that they may have the power to live the life that is pleasing to you, not pleasing to the world, but pleasing to you. 
Move among us today. Touch us. May Jesus be glorified. For it's in his holy name we pray. Amen.